get uh, too much into uh, what God's laid in my heart today. I just want to say uh, up front, and, and, and so you can honestly say that you heard it here first, okay? I am, I am prophesying that the Dallas Cowboys will win today. <laughs> so, <clears throat> just putting it out there. Uh, I don't know about you guys, it, yesterday was, uh, was some really crazy football games were on. I uh, had the, the unique opportunity to actually watch some of them, which rarely happens. Uh, with, with three little ones, but I exiled them to their room and banished them from coming into my presence while we watched a little bit of the Ravens game and the uh, Panthers game. But it's some really good football games, and, uh, and I don't want to diminish what we're talking about today uh, too much, but I, I do want to say that, you know, I find it unique and, and very interesting that after every football game uh, in the NFL, there are a group of men that will, <clears throat> excuse me, from, from both teams actually, that will kneel down uh, at midfield and pray. And um, <clears throat> I, I find it interesting that they're allowed to do that, but yet my kid, if he wants to take his Bible to school for private reading time, he can't do that. And I, I just think that's a, a travesty. But anyways, um, so as I said earlier, today is uh, National Human Trafficking Awareness Day. So if you guys... Um, have never contemplated what that kind of looks like. Um, you can you can look at International Justice Missions website, or you can go to Compassion International. Uh, both of those are, are well-regarded organizations that are working towards ending human slavery, which still goes on today, even though uh, uh, Abraham Lincoln signed his little piece of paper 160 some odd years ago. Uh, and also <clears throat> the human trafficking aspect, which is uh, uh, predominantly. Um, more prevalent in the European nations, although it has seen a, a remarkable rise and increase in uh, activity here in the United States, which is a shame. But um, <clears throat> speaking of things that are illegal, um, so how many of you have ever gotten in trouble with the law? I, uh, one person. I, you know, thank you for your honesty. Uh, and, 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 and so let me be clear, because everybody's sitting here going, well, I've never killed anybody. You know. Um, <clears throat> Well, it was exposed from my record. Uh, so, so let me kind of kind of bring it a little broader and say, I don't mean necessarily like you committed a felony, okay? But how many of you have like uh, gotten a speeding ticket or a parking ticket or a moving violation? I'm glad to see you guys are more responsive this time than last time because I, I had this whole thing in here about lying and how it's, you know, against the Ten Commandments just in case no one put their hand up. Uh, so I'll just say on, on my own behalf, over the, over the course of my life in, in driving and, and, and owning and operating a motor vehicle, I've probably gotten uh, maybe about eight total speeding tickets. And, and since moving to New York, I've had more parking tickets uh, than anything else. Um, one of the most confusing things is figuring out which side of the street on what day, uh, because the signs don't always tell the truth. I'm learning this. Uh, and I've also learned that... Um, it doesn't matter if it says no standing, that also means no parking. Oh. Okay, I thought no standing was like I couldn't stand on the corner. Okay, I found out it means no parking. So, you know, in the South we use very literal terms, you know. No parking means no parking, right? No standing means no standing. So, I've, I've had to learn all the, the lingo, but... Um, so, so let me just say, and, and, and just kind of on a side note, you know, my mom... In, in her 76 years on this earth, believe it or not, has never gotten not the first speeding ticket or parking violation. Now, she's not been driving for all 76 years. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, I just find it, 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 it's amazing when you meet somebody that has never, you know, run afoul of the law. I mean, honestly. Because we, we all do it. I remember the most recent speeding ticket I got. We were actually traveling to Virginia. Uh, we'd done one of those crazy things where we leave at like 7 o'clock in the evening here, you know, and drive all night through. And so we hit the Baltimore, Maryland area at like, I don't know, Odark 30. Like, I think that translates to like 1.15 in American time. And so <clears throat> it's, it's really, really late. I'm exhausted. Michelle and the entire car has fallen asleep on me. And I've engaged autopilot, which by the way is just cruise control, it doesn't steer for you. But um, <clears throat> I had engaged the cruise control and, and for just this one split second, because there's no traffic anywhere on, on the highways, I kind of let my eyes close. 
uh, and I didn't realize that my foot was resting on the gas pedal. And, and so um, they had this wonderful thing, which I think should be illegal or unconstitutional at the minimum. But they had these fighter jets, you know, that fly over, and they're, they're taking pictures of people speeding. You know, like how they can tell when they're doing Mach 3 what you're doing, I'll never understand. But um, anyways, I, I, got a, I got a speeding ticket. I was going a few miles over uh, at like 1 in the morning, and it happened to be a work zone even though there were no workers there. So <clears throat> it, it, it's interesting to me, and, and I, I get an opportunity to talk to people every now and again that have never gotten anything. And, and then, I, you know, I got to thinking about this, and I was like, you know, th this isn't really really too crazy, but, but what if I told you that there's actually someone that has never broken any law, ever? Ever. And, and let me be even more specific, because in, in this person's terminology of what is breaking the law, okay? Uh, it goes deeper than just, oh, I didn't speed, and I didn't commit a, a Class D felony, okay? When, when this person talks about breaking the law, this person actually said at one point that if you have not withheld or upheld any of the Ten Commandments, then you have broken them all. That's tough, right? I mean, you may have never killed anybody, but you lied, so you have killed somebody, according to that kind of rationale. And so what I want us to do today is I want us to take a look at the life of Jesus, specifically one, one little section of, of his life, because I think it's really important that, that, we, that we understand the, the, the depth of the law in which Jesus never violated. And I think it's even more important for us that we understand the actual principles and context behind the laws that he never violated. Because if you can do that, if you can kind of understand where Jesus was coming from, and not just the fact that, oh, well, he's the Son of God, so he's not going to break any laws. And, and I give you that. That's a great, a, gr a great piece of reasoning. But, but the problem is, is that there are some laws that... The principle of the law is more important than what the actual law is. And he never violated the principles of the law. And so what I want us to do today, if you've got your, 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 your different uh, Bibles or items out, is go ahead and turn to Matthew chapter 5. This is probably the next two chapters in Matthew 5 and 5 through 7. Uh, handle one of like the most famous sermons that's ever been recorded in human history. Uh, better than Paul when he went to Mars Hill. Uh, it, it, it's mo the most profound bit of teaching and preaching that you will ever hear. And it is the Sermon on the Mount. I mean, this is probably the epitome of dialogue. And, and in fact, in some seminaries, they actually teach you how to preach based on the Sermon on the Mount model. And, and that's a really um, unique concept to try and learn. But what I want us to do is I want us to really emphasize... The fact that while in the fact that Jesus never broke the law, he actually revealed something to us, not only about our hearts, but also about his heart when, when he did this. And, and, and so let, let, me, let me throw out this statement. Matt Chandler, uh, a pastor in Dallas, Texas, wrote a book called The Explicit Gospel. If you haven't had a chance to read it, you should. But consider this statement. He says, quote, the problem is that, as we have demonstrated, there is a chasm between God and us. And the problem compounding that problem is that not only does our sinfulness cause this chasm, but our sinfulness prevents us from being able to bridge the chasm ourselves. The same law of God that diagnoses our depravity cannot cure it. We are not just down, we are out. There is no pulling ourselves up by our bootstraps in this situation. We have dug ourselves into a grave too deep to climb out. We need radical intervention. And then he does a dramatic thing, which in reading is really hard to pick up on the dramatic things. But he, 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 he does a paragraph shift. Okay? And he indents a little bit. And then he puts these two words. Enter grace. Enter grace. And what I want us to do today is I want us to talk about how this thing, <clears throat> that in order for us to get out of this chasm, because we're all stuck in this chasm at some point, 
If we have not accepted Christ as our Lord and Savior, there's a chasm between us and God. If we are a Christian and we've accepted Him, but we, we have allowed sin to creep back into our lives and we're not addressing heart issues, and let me tell you something, the heart issue is far more important than the action. And Jesus talks about that. But if we allow heart issues to get in, into our life again and these sins creep back in, what we do is instead of the chasm, because we've already crossed that, what we do is we erect a wall. And some of us have walls as thick as the walls of Jericho. And some of us have no walls, and praise God for that. <clears throat> but let me encourage you that while we're looking through this today, is that the only way to get in between our, our, our depravity and where God wants to meet us with grace, the only way to get there is, is to actually allow God's grace to enter the situation. You may say, well, that sounds like you're, you're kind of double-talking here. Well, no, work with me here for a second. You see, God's grace, from the moment that Jesus stepped on the face of this planet, in fact, even stepped back further to creation, when God was in heaven and He was speaking things into existence, His grace was already there. What we have to do is we have to recognize the fact that the grace of God is just as eternal as God Himself. But what we have to do is we have to allow that grace to intervene in our lives. You see, my friend who's HIV positive and is lost and doesn't really know what's going on with his life, he'll acknowledge the fact that there is a God. He will acknowledge the fact that he is lost through his own decision, decisions and choices. And he will tell me that I'm so lost but I am so desperately seeking to be found. But the thing is, is that God's grace is never going to meet him until he says, Okay, God, I need your grace. Please, shower me with your grace. He has to allow God to do that. Because we are not robots. God did not, you know, create us to where, you know, if you do this action, then, then you know, this is what you'll do, and this is how you'll be. None of us are pre-programmed. The only thing we come into this world already like pre-programmed with, if you will, is our own sin nature. That's the only thing we step into existence with. In fact, if, for those of you who are dads, I want you to think back to the first time that you realized your toddler could understand what no meant. And then remember what he did the first time you told him no. Because for my toddlers... It was always, no, 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 Camden, no, Jack, no, Riley, don't touch that. <laughs> it, it's an innate thing. We're all born with that. But when they get to a place, when we all get to a place where we're willing to accept what God is doing in our lives, it's no longer, it's now more of, oh, God, help me. God, I need your grace. God, I, I need you to breathe life back into me. Because in and of ourselves, we will always repel God. Left to our own devices, we will always stiff arm God. Always. Because in our humanness, we think we've got it covered. If our humanness could cover it, would we have a problem with slavery today? If our humanness could cover it, would there be human trafficking today? If, if our humanness could cover it, would there have been two NYPD officers gunned down in cold-blooded murder as they sat in their squad car? If our humanness could cover it, would there be any reason why a 12-year-old would be charged with the murder of their parents? You see... This is the crux of everything that Jesus teaches us about. And we have to allow God's grace to enter the situation. So what I want us to do is I want us to focus on one little small section of the Sermon on the Mount. Verses 17 through 20. So if you're not already there, that's where we're going to hang out. But before we get into that, you guys know I love context. I, I really do. It's like what I enjoy most about sermon prep. So let me kind of start you off here. Uh, this is called the Sermon on the Mount because Jesus, 
who was traveling, stopped on the side of a hillside near Capernaum and delivered this teaching. Now, before any of you freak out and think, man, that was a long sermon. It, this was probably a compilation of like two or three days worth of teaching and preaching. Okay? Uh, all combined together. And, and I love when people tell me that Jesus was a great teacher. Because I always point back to the very beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Where he says stuff like, um, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for Him. For the kingdom of heaven is theirs. And I sit here and I think, okay, how does that reconcile with the homeless person in New York City that sleeps on a, on a grate at night with one eye open to watch their stuff and the other eye closed so that they can at least rest a little bit? How, how does that reconcile? I mean, here's, a, here's a, our mayor who owns this nice house in Park Slope and has access to a mansion, and yet there's homeless people in his city. So how does it rectify? Now, how, how, how is it that the poor are blessed? And, and when he goes on to say that, that God blesses those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Well, okay, I kind of see that. I, I kind of wrap my mind around that. When you have friends and family that love on you and you lose someone that's close to you, I, I see where they would come around you and comfort you. That They would, they would kind of wrap their arms around you and, and they would bring you to that. But what about those who have no one? And lose the last person that they had. And then he goes on to say that God blesses those who are humble. For they will inherit the entire earth. And I look at some of the football players who are very humble. They have opportunities to be brash and arrogant and everything. But they don't. And yet they can hardly ever win a football game. Or a Super Bowl. Or whatever. Whatever the, the achievement of success is that they're looking for. Then I look at, you know, I take a step away from that because it's really kind of hard to idolize a multimillionaire. So then you have to take a step down, right? And you say, okay, well, what about that guy that I know that lives on my street that you'll never know the things that he does for people because he does it without trying to get adulation. But yet, everything, like, that could happen to this guy happens. And he continues to just grin and bear it. How about your pastors? I mean, most pastors, believe it or not, live below the federal poverty line. Now, you don't hear most of your pastors getting up and begging for pay increases or pay raises or groceries or anything like that. But when I hear teaching like this, I have to sit and I have to think, okay, I wouldn't call Jesus a good teacher. Because it's hard to wrap your, your mind around some of these ideas. Now, as a pastor, before I get stoned for heresy and fired tomorrow, understand, he's not a great teacher. He's a revolutionary. In his day and time, what he's saying there went against all the cultural standards, went against all the religious standards, went against everything that common culture and common thought process of anyone that had half a brain would think. Their culture, believe it or not, although it has its nuances, is not much different than ours today. We're all about killing the person in front of us on the corporate ladder, doing whatever we can to squash them into the ground so that we can advance ourselves. We're all about making sure that, hey, I'm going to get mine, okay, and you worry about yours. In fact, I heard it even said that um, my, my son and I, my oldest son, Ash, we were sitting down talking one night. We were making fun of, of all these horror films. Now, I, I don't watch horror films, but we were making fun of them. Because uh, everybody's, I'm sure, seen at least one or a, a scene of one. But uh, he was always talking about how, you know, when the zombie apocalypse happens, you know, there's always, you know, one guy that always bites it there at the end. You know, he's the last guy to die or whatever. I looked at Ash, I said, listen, if the zombie apocalypse happens today, all I have to do is trip you and keep running. Okay? Because they'll get you, but they ain't going to get me, right? And, and that's a joke, and I mean, we, we all kind of joke about it, but look, that's how we live life. That's how we live life. I watched last night as one of my neighbors, and he actually pays for this parking spot on our street. And so he's sitting there, and for like 20 minutes, he's laying on his horn because somebody is in his parking spot. And so I went down to him and said, you know, it's almost bedtime for the boys. And so I was just, 
I figured if you knew the guy, I'd go to the guy's house and just ask him, hey, can you move? Because my friend John here needs his, his spot, you know. Well, <clears throat> I go down there. Of course, he didn't know who, who was driving the car, but he's, he's been laying on his horn. And so the entire time I'm talking to him, he's not, he's not blowing his horn. We had like a 25-minute conversation in the freezing cold, you know. I'm sitting there shaking like this, you know. And, um, and, and, and so I just said to John, I said, well, man, I said, why don't you like, call the tow company or call the police? Or... And he said to me, he goes, he said, there's no point. He said, in New York, I can't just call a tow company because I already got a guy that would do that for me. He said, I have to get the police to come down. They got to ticket the guy. And then we start the process of a tow truck. He said, you know, it's, it's real complicated. I said, well, then what are you going to do? I said, you can't sit in here and blow your horn all night long. I said, I'm sure your neighbor's going to hate you for that. And he goes, I'm giving the guy one more minute. And if he don't come out here, I'm going to take a knife, I'm going to slash his tires, and I'm going to leave. <laughs> All right, now this is, this is John, though. I mean, this is the kind of crazy guy he is. And, and I'm sitting here as I was walking back up to my, my apartment because I said, well, I don't want to be a witness to nothing. <laughs> uh, typical New Yorker, right? Um, <clears throat> so I'm, I'm going back up to my apartment, and the thought hits me. It's like, wait a second, what about doing to others what you would have them do unto you? You know, the flip side of the argument is the dude never showed park there. There's signs up. No parking, right? But, but, does that give us the right to react? Now, in, in Jesus' words, he would have said, blessed are those who let the parking spot go, right? Because you'll inherit a parking lot, right? <laughs> I, I mean, work with me here a little bit, but I mean, that, that, that's what Jesus teaches, Okay? And, and I, I'm sitting here and I'm like, okay, well, you know, how would Jesus have handled this? And, then, and this is what I read. I said, uh, this is uh, verse 17. Don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the law of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. And I have to stop there. Because God didn't come to do away with the laws of man, the laws of Moses, the writings of the prophets. He instead came to accomplish their purpose. Do you know what the purpose of law is? It's a radical thought, okay? So hang on to this. But the purpose of law is to show you your absolute need for grace. That's the purpose of law. It's to show you that without a Savior, you can't do this. There are over 618 laws in the Old Testament. And Jesus said, no, 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 I didn't come to get rid of those. I came to accomplish their purpose. So what I want us to do for a few seconds is look at, look at some of this. So uh, it goes on to say, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not even the smallest detail of God's law will disappear until its purpose is achieved. So if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. But I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, I read that for a second. I was like, okay, this is, this is solid, you know, good teaching right here. So, but wait a second. He just said, I have to be better than the righteousness of the Pharisees. Can anyone top the Pharisees on self-perceived righteousness? I mean, you got to remember, I mean, put this in context. The Pharisees were the same guys that when a sinner walks into the temple courtyard and he's over in a corner with his head buried against the wall, beating his chest, saying, Dear God, have mercy on me, a sinner. The Pharisee is the one that stands right up in the middle of everybody and goes, Oh God, thank you that I am not a sinner like that guy over there. Thank you, God, that I give 80% of my income to you. Oh God, thank you that I have never cursed 
that I have never thought ill of my neighbor. And sweet Jesus, I love macaroni and cheese. Amen? Amen. <laughs> so I've got to be more righteous than those guys. Well, wait a second. Wait a second. Now, does Jesus want me doing that? Or does Jesus want a heart of righteousness? And you see, that's where the real complicated section comes. Because you see, we're real, real quick to diagnose others. If, if I wanted to, I could, I could go up through here and, and say, oh, you know, Brother Roy. Oh, Brother Roy. It's going to be a cold day in heaven before you're ever going to make those gates. You know what I'm saying? See, I could say those things. And I could point to things in Roy's life that maybe aren't good, right? But, but Jesus says, listen, instead of concerning yourselves with pointing out everybody else's flaws, why don't you turn that thing around and look at yourself? You see, because that's really where it's at. You see, God didn't put us on this earth to judge. God put us on this earth to love others. In fact, that is at the very core of the gospel message. The gospel message in John 3.16 is for God so loved the world that he gave. It's not about what you can proclaim with your hands high, screaming at the top of your voice in front of an audience. It's what happens in the quietness of that dimly lit room in your heart. Do you put a spotlight on that area? Or do you keep it hidden away? Because it's not convenient to deal with right now. <clears throat> so let me kind of unpack what we talked about a little bit. I'm going to do like the, the amplified message slash um, almost heretical paraphrase of this passage. So don't, don't kill me. But it, it, it would look something like this in today's language. Look, don't get what I'm doing twisted. I didn't come to eliminate or replace the Ten Commandments. Alright? Y'all can step off a little bit. Okay? I'm not here to do away with the 618 laws that Moses gave or the prophecies from the prophets or the writings or any of that stuff. Y'all just back down. Alright? What I came to do was I came to tell you that I'm going to obey perfectly. Me. I'm going to obey perfectly or complete the teaching of or fulfill fully the Old Testament prophecy. That's what Jesus is saying. I'm not here to do away with stuff. I'm not here to eliminate things. I'm not here to, to tell you that, oh, this was wrong and I've got it all figured out. I'm not trying to do away with the revelation of God's will through the writings of the prophets or the Old Testament prophecies. Instead, I am here to obey fully, to fully fulfill those prophecies. That's why I'm here. And because I'm the guy that's here, and this is what God wanted me to do, and because I'm God's son, and because I am the fulfillment of these prophecies, let me talk to you a little bit about the proper way to do this thing we call life. <clears throat> you got to kind of break this down a little bit with me, so work with me for just a second. The Old Testament laws were actually broken, in, broken down into three categories. There's ceremonial law, there's civil law, and then there's moral law. The ceremonial, excuse me, ceremonial law is basically relating specifically to how Israel is to worship God. So let me give you an example of that. In Leviticus chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, it says, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. When you present an animal as an offering to the Lord, you may take it from your herd of cattle or your flock of sheep and goats. If the animal you present as a burnt offering is from the herd, it must be a male with no defects. Bring it to the entrance of the tabernacle so you may be accepted by the Lord. So that's what Leviticus says. Now, <clears throat> it's kind of like this. The passage is dealing with how Israel is supposed to present itself to worship a holy, defect-free God. Okay? That's the whole point of that passage in Leviticus. It is to show us how to present a sacrifice to God that will be accepted by a holy and righteous God. 
So it looks like this in your life and in my life. It looks like this. We come to church and put on our church face. We sit here and we play the church Christian game. We smile appropriately when we have to. We shake the hand of the person we don't like and say, good morning, God bless you. In our mind, we're like, I hope you fall down the steps and hurt yourself. Okay? But, but this is how we do. We play a game. We put on our mask and we play this game. When the pastor says something that we feel he's looking for verbal affirmation, sometimes we'll oh, amen. And when it's me preaching, like y'all look at me like, oh, he's going to come after us. <clears throat> But, but that's what we do. I mean, we're conditioned to react and respond a certain way based on our environment. I'm driving you crazy with that thing. Why not? Keep having to move that thing. <laughs> uh, so, so we're conditioned to respond a certain way based on how we think or how we perceive we're supposed to act. And then we go home. And the minute we get in the car and we look up in the rearview mirror and we see that the, the church is safely out of sight, because that's the only place God hangs out. We take the mask off, right? And then we're back to our normal selves. And we're our normal selves Monday through Friday until the next time we come to church. So Wednesday night prayer meeting, we put on our somber, we need to pray for our brothers and sisters. Face, right? I've seen y'all. Trust me. Okay, I do it too. I've done it. I've done it. And then we come back on Sunday morning. And we've got a different face mask that we put on. You know, this is the Sunday morning. Please, dear Jesus, come. You know, we, we have, we're, we're conditioned that way. Right? That's how we do. Jesus is saying, look, how about this rabbi idea? You take the mask off and leave it off. How about this rabbi idea? You walk into church and you truly want to experience the presence of God in that moment. But not only just in the moment, you want to take that thing with you and unpack it all week long. Some of the best communing time with God that I have had in my life has been when I have been deep in Bible study on whatever day it was. And God kept bringing situation after situation after situation into my life all week long that dealt with what I just studied. You see, that is growing in the faith. But the, the key thing here is that what compels us to put on the mask in the first place is we have a heart problem. And that's what God wants to address. He says, so if you're going to bring to me this thing on Sunday morning that you call praise and worship, and you're going to lay it at my feet, make sure it's clean. Let me ask you a question. I like hard-hitting questions because I ask myself this a lot. Are you clean this morning? Have you brought that unblemished sacrifice to God this morning to be accepted at the gates of His tabernacle? Are you just mouthing the words to the praise and worship songs? Or are you truly feeling a holy God creator that wants to commune with you this morning. I have, to, I, have to, I have to really unpack that myself. Because it's so easy to fall into a game where it's, oh, well, I have to do this, 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 and this. And if I do this, then I get a check mark by my name today. It's so easy to do that. And just looking at Leviticus, God's saying, look, this may be about an animal sacrifice, and we don't do that anymore, okay, because Jesus came, and when he died on the cross, he took the place of the animals, okay, and, and praise God for that, because I love pork and bacon, all right, so, but, but God did away with animal sacrifices, but the principle is still the same, is your heart pure, are you clean, you see, that's, that's really the crux of ceremonial law. <clears throat> the next one is civil law. Now this applied really to daily living in Israel. For example, Deuteronomy 24 verses 10 through 11 says, If you lend anything to your neighbor, do not enter his house to pick up the item he has given as security. 
You must wait outside while he goes in and brings it out to you. And you might be thinking, well, it's kind of weird when we use this as an example. Well, no, not really. You see, what Jesus is talking about, what God's talking about here, the whole point behind a passage like that is that, look, even the person that's in debt to someone else has the right, has the right to feeling good about who they are. They have the right to walk away with some of their dignity. So you can't just be barging up into somebody's home and taking their stuff. Instead, you wait outside and wait them to bring it to you. Let them have some dignity in it. Now, if you fall behind and a collection agency is going to come take your bed, try enforcing that because it ain't going to happen. All right? But the thing is this. Is that when was the last time that you put yourself out for a friend? Maybe they're a Christian. And then you called them up, you say, hey man, I, I, you know, I'm in kind of a tight spot myself, I really kind of need the money I loaned you. The guy goes, man, things have gone from bad to worse. Well, you told me you'd give me the title of your car. You know, I, man, I'm, I hate to do this, but man, I really, really need the cash. Can you give me the title to your car? Probably y'all have never done that. Um, I would never. Somebody's car title, I wouldn't do that. But, but I mean, understand. The guy owes you. He, he, made, he made a guarantee that, look, this is, this is going to absolve if I fall behind. And then he falls behind. And then he doesn't want to give you the title to the car. I mean, well, what do you do with that? But see, then you look at it again. And you look at the gold rule, which is in chapter 7, and you do to others what you have them do to you. And then you remember back at the very beginning of chapter 5, where God in verse 1 says, Hey, blessed are the poor who is on here at the kingdom of heaven. Well, now you're poor, right? You need the money. You got Jesus' teachings. But you also have Deuteronomy's teachings. And you sit here and you go, Man, I, you know, what do I do with this? Then you have to remember. Who are you trusting in for your finances? You trust in yourself? I mean, we already looked at what trust in ourselves gets us. The world we currently live in, right? So we can't fix it. Who gave you the job? I've seen a couple of y'all. It ain't your good looks, all right? I'm just saying. Love you, but it, it ain't that, right? So who gave you the job? Oh, the, the easy church answer, since y'all got your mask on. The real easy one, oh, Jesus, God, amen, the Bible, right? It's true, God gave you the job. Let me ask you a question. How faithful are you with your heart at your job for Jesus? Now, I ain't talking about necessarily beating people over the head and preaching to them about the cross. Do you work as if you were working for Jesus Christ himself at your job? Are you pouring yourself into it? Are you doing what you're supposed to do and then some because you're doing it for God, not for Cigna Health or whoever else? Are you pouring yourself into what you do? So here's the civil law. But the principle, again, with the civil law, it's all about the heart. It's all about that. So we've already looked at ceremonial, which has pretty much been done away with. We've looked at the civil, which has some great principles and guidelines that we should follow. Okay? But because of our modern society and culture being so radically different from where Scripture was written in the Old Testament, we can't, can't, can't match these up perfectly. They can't be followed specifically. But the principle are timeless. And the principle should be guiding our conduct daily. So after the symbol, the third type is our moral law, which is basically a direct command of God that requires strict obedience. For example, the Ten Commandments. A nice one, Exodus 20, 13. Don't murder. That's a good one, right? I mean, everybody in here okay with not killing somebody? 
Just one person. That's awesome. Everybody else wants to kill people. All right. See how y'all is. I ain't inviting none of y'all over to my house. So, <clears throat> so here's don't murder. Well, look, the moral law reveals a very important thing. The moral law reveals a very, very, very important thing because it is revealing the nature and the will of God. You see, the, the, the will of God and the nature of God, which, by the way, still applies today, okay, is to compel us to bring glory to God. It is all about bringing praise back to God. Jesus' life on this earth was not so we could look back and say, well, he was a good teacher. It was so we could look and say, praise God, that he loved us enough to send him here. The point of all of Scripture was grace entering the scene through the cross and the tomb. It's not because Isaiah was a great guy to read about, although he was. It's not because Jeremiah had a crazy story, and he does. Okay? It's not about Noah and the flood, although that's pretty cool. It's not about Abraham and Isaac. It's not about the disciples. It's not about the upper room, the lower room, the lower west side. It's not about any of those things. The whole point of Scripture screams out a cross and a resurrected tomb. Because on the cross hung grace. And out of the tomb came salvation. And that is what each one of us, each and every one of us needs today. We need more of this. So when we talk about, hey, you know, Jesus obeyed these laws completely. He never sinned. He, he never did any of these things. It's not about what he didn't do. It's about what he accomplished just a few months or years later when he hung on the cross and stretched his arms wide so that he could embrace every single person, nationality, sins upon himself. And then for three days could go down and fight the devil in hell on his own turf, kick him in the shin a couple times, take some souls with him, and then pop out the tomb on the third day. And in that process... He said, I know Paulo Oscuro on such and such day will kneel and ask me to be his savior. And I know Din Din will on such and such a day kneel and ask me to be her Lord and heavenly savior. And I know Steve Lane will one day kneel down and beg and plead with Jesus to come into his life. And I will grant salvation and grace and righteousness and mercy to these individuals. Even though they don't deserve a lick of it. And our job is to make sure that the heart that we bring in here, when we look to be edified, when we look to be encouraged, when we look to be equipped, when we look to the church to help us be more uh, equipped and a better representative of them outside of these walls, the thing that we're supposed to do is bring in an open heart, a pure one. And in some cases, that purity happens while we're here. And that's awesome. But how many of us walk out the door taking that dirty baggage with us? How many of us refuse to open our hearts? And we refuse to clean, to, to, to do the things we need to do to cleanse ourselves? I mean, when was the last time you got on your knees, whether it was here or at home or in your prayer closet, whatever, and just begged God? To take a Brillo pad to your heart and clean you and purify you. And if you're not doing that, why? Because each one of us has a little section of ourselves that we hold back from God. Each one of us does. We, we have this one little section we get tucked away back here. A lot of times we forget it's even there. We go on about doing things and praising Jesus and loving people and spreading the word. And we do all the things we're supposed to do. And we forget that that little part's back there. And then one day, when the circumstances are just right, 
It pops back into our mind. Oh, forgot about that. And see, we have a choice then. We hit our knees, repent, beg for purity, beg for cleansing, or we let it run. Maybe slide a rug over it, walk out the room, keep the door shut, put stuff in front of the door. And Jesus is sitting here saying, no, 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 no. He, he says, listen, <clears throat> if you ignore the least commandment and teach others to do the same, you will be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But anyone who obeys God's laws and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Now catch this. But I warn you. And this is in red, so it's got to be important. Okay? It says, I warn you, unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. See, for all the show... And all the yelling that the Pharisees did, they had head knowledge of the law. But they didn't have a heart knowledge of Jesus, of God. They had it all up here. Probably some of the most academic dudes that you'll ever meet came out of top-notch seminaries and synagogues under the best teachers that Jewish, the Jewish nation had to offer could probably speak fluent Hebrew and Arabic and Aramaic and be all over the place with it. But their heart was as filthy rags. Their heart was all messed up. You know, no matter, no matter what the crux of this passage looks like to you, when you read it, no matter whether you like to dig into it and figure out what this kind of meant. The one thing, though, is that throughout all of Israel's history, throughout all of it, these laws were often misquoted and misapplied. In fact, when Jesus came, most of the, the things the Pharisees accused him of was not adhering to ceremonial laws that had been twisted by the Pharisees or by other religious leaders. You, you, can't, you can't hit all the laws that are in the Old Testament in your lifetime. I know some, some Jews believe you can't. It's impossible. Because the whole point of getting forgiveness for one thing is to turn away from it and walk in an opposite direction. It's not to keep going back. So it's not like, oh, well, for, for this day, I covered this sin right here. So I'm good for the rest of my life. And then you go do that sin. It, it's not like that. But when you, when you live under legalism, when you, when you live within the boundaries of just rules, and there's no grace, and there's no Jesus then what you have is you have a situation where your heart can never be pure. It can never be pure. Because you're too busy worried about dotting your I's and crossing your T's to be worried about what a relationship with Jesus Christ actually looks like. Or what a relationship with God actually looks like. Or what God would really have you do in a specific situation. So, Jesus was intent on bringing people back to the original purpose of the rules. And the original purpose of the law, the original purpose of the rules, was to show people an absolute need for a Savior. A need for grace. And Jesus is sitting there going, man, in just a short period of time, I'm going to be the embodiment of that grace for you. I'm going to usher it in in a way that will have this earth spinning on its ear for thousands of years. I'm going to do something so radical and so crazy that people will fight wars over whether or not it actually happened. And there's going to be relics that they're going to fight over and pretend that they're 
discovering and guarding for thousands of years. But it's all really boiling down to one thing, and that's grace. It's grace. In our vision statement, we say that we want to have a gospel-centered mission and life in our service and all these things. We want to be gospel-centered. We're doing the Bible study for Sunday school, gospel-centered church. But how many of you actually recognize the fact that the gospel message contained in Scripture all points to one place? It all points to three days. We're guessing somewhere in April. Where the, the, the Son of God hung on a tree, was buried, and three days later rose again. That's gospel centered message. And when you have friends who are sitting there going, Oh, I have no hope, well, then you need to do what 1 Peter tells us to do. We should always be ready to give an answer and a defense for the hope that we have. Or we should go a step further, maybe do something like Romans 1.16. Romans 1.16, I didn't memorize this one. For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes the Jew first. And then the Gentile. So how are you doing? How are you doing with God and what He commands us to do? You take it a step further. How's your heart today? You see, Jesus will tell you. And you can read this further into the, the Sermon on the Mount. It's all in there. But Jesus will tell you, look, if you harbor hate in your heart for your brother, you've committed murder. If you look at a woman in lust, you've already committed adultery with her. If you don't forgive someone that did something to you, I'm not going to forgive you. If you won't acknowledge me before man, then I will not acknowledge you before the Father. These are great teachings. They're awesome when you understand the heart of it. The heart of every single one of it is true. Where's your heart today? When was the last time that you looked in the mirror and you said, okay God, I need you to be real with me today. What's my spiritual EKG look like? Have you done that lately? I'm going to close by telling you this. I did a spiritual EKG a few years back. And what I found was I had a heart murmur. Not a real one. A spiritual one. You see, I found I, I became very, very comfortable with... My head knowledge. Well, I had heart knowledge too. But I was relying mostly on my head knowledge. I got very, very comfortable living in that. I got so comfortable with it that I could actually sin and at the same time do devotions. I got, I got so good at it that I could talk and preach to someone, a friend or a co-worker, Talk to them about all the mistakes they were making in their life. While still being in a sin in my own life. I got so good at it that I could miss here the Holy Spirit and His conviction in my heart. But then, through a series of events that had to transpire in my life to get my attention attention. And I'm not perfect because I'm just a man. I put my pants on one leg at a time just like everybody else. But I've gotten in the habit of examining myself a little bit more frequently than before. Because you see, for me, when I die, 
I want my kids in that room, little terrors that they may be, I want them to look back and say, you know what? My dad wasn't the best man, but he sure did love God and he loved us. I want my wife to say, you know what? He's never been a perfect husband, but he sure did love God and he loved me. And I want my legacy to be that I always pointed back to Jesus. Because when I hit the pearly gates, whenever my time is, I want Jesus to say, well done. You see, that, that is what God means when he uses his son to say, blessed are the poor, for they will inherit the kingdom of heaven. That is what Jesus meant when he said, do to other people what you have them do unto you. You see, it's all about the heart. Let's pray. Dear God, we come to you this morning. And God, I, I thank you for what you've shown me through this.